Hi, everybody. Let me start by saying thank you to the Nikoi uh, Dojo team for allowing this to happen. I think it's fantastic that we can come together. So I'm currently based in San Francisco, but I'm originally from uh, Toronto, Canada. I have long backstory. I have a fraternal twin brother that has identical interests that I do. Grew up loving biology from a very young age. I did my undergrad in life science at the Queen's University. So general science degree, but in my last year, I specialized in immunology. And during my undergrad, I had the opportunity to work in several basic and clinical research labs, which is a great opportunity, but I often felt that the whole purpose of that was just to publish a paper. So I wanted something more translational when I, when I did my PhD. So I did my PhD in a, a T cell development lab in Dr. Wong Collins and Nico Fluker at the University of Toronto. And in that lab, I tried to understand how to grow stem cells into immune cells and develop technologies that can mimic the whole process outside the body. And at the time, the ambition was to regenerate the immune system of cancer patients that undergone chemotherapy and radiation that quickly evolved, because it's 2016, 2017, into engineering those immune cells with, with synthetic circuits um, to reprogram them to fight cancer. But for me, science is very personal. My parents don't have an education beyond high school, so I really wanted to make something count through my PhD. So I co-founded a company um, called Notch Therapeutics with my professor. Um, and the idea for that is to build um, this these T cells, these accessible engineered T cells for different indications like cancer, for example. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. Last year, we raised our Series A for about um, $85 million USD. We have about 90 people on, on the team now, so it's growing very well. Uh, but for me and my journey, uh, last year, I felt like my role in the company was just further to optimize the platform, the technology. So I wanted a different challenge post-graduation. So last year, I flew to San Francisco, met the team of 50 years, I fell in love with their, their thesis of supporting entrepreneurial scientists, create iconic companies, decided to join the team full-time as a bio person, but also developing the venture capitalists that I wish I had spoken to when I started my entrepreneurial journey. So super happy to be here and super happy to provide my perspective of a building company from a, from a PhD. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack. I'm a co-founder of a company called Ochre Bio, based in Oxford, with a site in the US as well. We develop RNA therapies for chronic liver diseases, we use a lot of genomics in, in our approach to that. My backstory was I did an undergrad in biomedical engineering on the west of Ireland, the wet, rainy west of Ireland, um, and was thinking about doing a PhD and spent a lot of time during that time. I did a fellowship with the PhD group but didn't have a very positive experience um, during my kind of work there and decided I wanted to go straight into it, more focus on industry. And, and as Ashton alluded to, the, the translational work that it takes to bring science to, to bedside. So kind of pivoted um, and kind of tried to short circuit my, my PhD thing, but that comes with uh, with challenges as well. So happy to talk about that in more detail. But I, I went over to the US and worked for early stage health tech and biotech companies, most recently of Exus, which was bought out by Novartis and brought one of the first gene therapies to market before coming back and starting OCA. Um, but yeah, pretty excited to talk about this topic and hopefully I have something useful to share. So I'm Anna Cornell. I'm the CEO and founder of Acorn GenX. Uh, I started Acorn kind of out of a need that I noticed in my own life. So we focus on developing the first completely private at-home DNA testing device. And when I was 16 and my dad was diagnosed with genetic disorder, I wanted to go and get tested. And I found that there was no good way to go about it. So I could have either gone to my insurance and through the doctor and insurance and it would have cost several thousands of dollars because guess what? 98% of genetic tests are not covered by insurance. Uh, looking at the other route, the 23andMe ancestry, the uh, classic genetic testing route, I noticed that most of these companies profit off of selling information to third parties. Uh, I was not very interested in having my DNA be part of a database that was being sold and traded to who knows who. And um, that's kind of my motivation for starting Acorn. I was in my sophomore year when I started it and I'd worked in three GenX lab prior, um, ranging from Feinberg, from of course the Field Museum and um, I kind of took the experience that I had, like taking whatever courses I could online and uh, working in these various labs and start working that initial design for Acorn. Um, two years later, I dropped out of school. I was the recipient of the Teal Fellowship for the class of 2021. And uh, we've raised some funding through the NSF and are currently pursuing a couple of SBIRs and are hopefully gonna be able to take our product to market in the next two and a half years. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm the founder of Nucleus Genomics. I think, you know, I echo the sentiments of a lot of other founders here in that my story with science begins with a personal tragedy. My cousin actually died of a genetic condition when I was around <clears throat> eight years old. 
And I remember thinking, how is it possible that, you know, a genetic defect can cause someone to die? So I started studying genetics. And what I realized was that disease is not an inherent property of human beings, but can be viewed as a problem to be solved. So I joined one of the first uh, do-it-yourself genetic labs in the country where we engineered yeast to make them illuminate, you know, edited bacteria to make them resistant to antibiotics. And then I was like, well, what if you could combine this kind of depth of biology with the malleability of computer science, right? Offering the beautiful intersection of bits and atoms. So I went to UPenn where I studied uh, computational biology. Eventually what happened was that the pandemic hit and I really wanted to analyze my own DNA. And in doing this research, I realized I could provide myself more genetic analysis on more diseases, more traits, better genetic analysis using algorithms I was developing and also um, compensation. So that assuming maximal data ownership and agency, if someone's data is shared, they're actually compensated for it. Um, I eventually left Penn and I, we raised a couple of million dollars from Founders Fund, CEO of Allergan, one co mentors of CRISPR, uh, CEO for Health and many others. And yeah, right. we actually opened up an office in a month in Soho. Um, so that's very exciting. Super excited to be here. Thank you guys for the introductions. I was going to say it's just pretty inspiring to see hearing how a lot of the founders uh, here also have like a personal connection to uh, the work that they're doing. I'll be asking a few individual questions and then, uh, yeah, then we can get right into it. It'll be directed at some people individually and we can go from there. Okay. So with that said, let's get right into it. So the first question here is really to everyone here. It's kind of to lay up the ground uh, and get a little more detail into the, each of you guys' uh, journey in creating a startup and the products behind the startup. So the first question uh, really comes down to, as co-founders, what was your direct role in um, you know, building the first iteration of your product? How did you guys play a role in that as co-founders? Um, you know, did you have other people helping you? Did you have another co-founder? What was your role eventually like? Ashton, I want to start with you. Then we'll go to Jack, then Anna, and then Keon. Great. Uh, so again, uh, my co company is called uh, Notch Therapeutics, and it's built on a platform which we call the Engineered Thymic Niche. And then during my PhD, as I mentioned before, was involved in understanding and building technologies to mimic what happens in the thymus, what, what mimics what happens when you well, try to make a stem cell into an immune cell, uh, for whatever indication you want to play with. And then my PhD was involved in making the technology. Um, and then, as you guys are very well aware, building a company requires many co-founders. So while my work was involved in creating this platform, we also had another co-founder named Shreya Shukla in a different lab, in Peter Zantra's lab at the time, University of Toronto. She had another IP that we put together, it collapsed into one, and we created this engineer thymic niche platform. Um, and then we became co-founders of the company and we, we spun that off into a, a biotech. Yeah, for, for me, I was fortunate to have a co-founder um, who'd been doing liver drug development for about 20 years. So he was a kind of world expert in setting up all of the, the key scientific infrastructure. My role in that, coming from more of an operational industry lens, was around kind of making sure we had the requisite finances, making sure we had the requisite regulatory approvals to do human tissue work. We do a lot of human tissue work in, in Ocabio wow. and, and kind of making sure, supporting the infrastructure to enable the science. So that was primarily what I was doing. So for me, during the first few, like the first six months, I definitely had a much more active role of uh, creating the product. So this, the initial design and the initial like um, models were all created by me. And then I went and I had two friends who were also like BME, biomedical engineers, um, and an electrical engineer. And we were like, okay, let's go. Let's try to model this in real life. Let's build it out. And um, as the team grew, because we're now up to like 20 people, I found that the more people joined, the more of a hands-off um, approach I had to the actual physical building. And um, these days I have very little to do with the actual uh, model and design beyond just making sure that everything is going according to plan and things are progressing as they need to be. But in terms of actually having my hands on it, not as much as I used to and kind of miss that sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first thing I would say is that, you know, biotech is a very broad umbrella, right? What Ashton and Jack and Anna are doing are pretty much categorically different than what we're doing, right? We're operating in the realm of bits and not atoms. So I think just, I think on any part of this conversation, getting PhD or not, and I will answer the question, but just to preface this, like a lot of the work we're doing is finally different and packaging everything up in biotech. Sure. You know, it's reasonable, but it, there's a bit many nuances and information points and, um, 
different uh, caveats. That said, um, <laughs> um, so I spent around the, did the person gone? Did you kick them out? Yes. I think it's a lot of disgruntled PhDs trying to harass our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and it begins. <laughs> uh, like, why did I go to school for so many years? These damn undergrads. Okay. So I spent the, around a year of time building the first uh, algorithms that underpin the application. And then eventually I started working with the statistical geneticist. And then post fundraising, as Anna said, you know, you end up taking more of a hands off approach. That's the short answer, at least. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for those introductions, guys. Um, yeah, I this is this is going to be more of a nuanced conversation, especially because like you know, um, it isn't uh, easy to directly compare the experiences from a software biotech and a and like a, I guess a traditional wet lab, more like a wet lab facing biotech company, wet lab born biotech company. So that the is kind of the we can even say the fact that we can even say software biotech shows how much biotech's changed. Right? What would have been software biotech twenty years ago? Don't even say that. I don't think so. That's a good point. That's a good point. The, right. the need to kind of differentiate is already itself pretty insane to attesting how far we've come as a field. Um, but yes, I guess that'll be a very big preface point coming into this conversation. Um, the goal of this conversation is to kind of get a consensus. So this kind of set the lay of the land um, going in. And uh, so with that said, <laughs> we're not going to try to uh, create beef between undergrads and PhD here. It's all out of love. Uh, and Ash, the PhD in the room, we will give you kind of the, uh, I want to give you the first question here. So okay. in what ways did your graduate school experience enable you to help build the Notch platform? And I guess as a small little follow up to that uh, later, do you think it would have been possible to do this if you didn't have the structure of a grad program or the people involved in the grad program? Fair enough. Um, but to echo, echo a bit what Keon said, like I wanna make something very clear when you read, we're talking about um, biotech, building a therapeutic company, very different than as you talked about before, building a software um, company as, as a foundation. Um, but I will start with saying, if you name any of your top software companies in the world, it could be Meta, I guess nowadays, or Google, requires a very strong developer. If you want to create a, a Intel, then a Harvard company requires a strong engineer. If you want to create a biotech company, it does require a deep understanding of the biology you're working with. Um, and, and that requires sometimes um, uh, 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 advanced training in a particular domain. And that may require a PhD. So for me, um, and developing the platform for it, it was 20 years of fundamental knowledge before I came into the actual lab. Um, and I leveraged that fundamental knowledge from my, my, my graduate professor to be able to um, build up my platform. It would be very hard pressed to do that outside of an academic institution. But I also say in graduate school, um, you develop a massive network of scientists and mentors that you wouldn't get in, in perhaps an, another, another area of, of life though. And when you're creating technology, you're constantly de-risking that technology by attending lab meetings um, with your peers, within your lab, with your professor. That's very important when you're ready, when you're ready to spin out the technology, as you guys can imagine. De-risking the technology is very important when you want to spin it out and create something actually truly um, impactful um, and you want to actually pitch to investors and all that. So I think my graduate experience helped me a lot um, in, in that aspect. But I would say, I wanna be very clear with the undergrads on this call here, no, you don't need a PhD to create a, a biotech company at all. Um, Ayo! Anybody, so you're on our side. <laughs> okay, it's, it's not, it's not that I'll go home. It's, as you guys know, it's a very nuanced discussion. You do not need a PhD. What you need is an advanced um, technical understanding of whatever, whatever domain you're working on. And you can get that from very different ways of doing it. But by far the most, the easiest way to do that is through a graduate education because you're exposed to so many incredible scientists around you and through a graduate school experience as well. I don't want to hear from the undergrads who dropped out on their take on the last point that Ashton said. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly, especially when he said that you need advanced technical understanding, but that doesn't necessarily mean PhD. I think that was basically the synthesis of what I was going to say, Ashton, um, right? Because I think if someone is sufficiently curious and willing just to basically do whatever they can to learn the material, right? Papers are online, go read them, right? You can become as versed in discipline as any scientist simply because you can read the same content that they're reading. You can easily go harass some PI somewhere and ask them questions. They'd be happy, some would be happy to answer, some not so much, but some would be. Um, you can kind of force your wealth, your way into the networks. And you know, academia, the way PhDs are structured is for you to be a scientist, not an entrepreneur. Right. So it's always baffles you when someone says that's like, changing, but yes, I mean, yes. traditionally, right? But like that, yeah. traditionally, right? So 
And thank you. Yeah, Ashley, if I say anything wrong, correct me to the <laughs> I have I have no PhD. So this is my from being in academia working in labs and also from interfacing, we have PhDs that are on the nucleus mm -hmm. team. This is kind of how I built my understanding of both of both the worlds. Mm -hmm. Um so from my experiences, from my experience in genomics, when I didn't understand something, I'd basically go, you know, I would go back to the literature, I'd just read the papers. And then in doing that, I would have, I think, as strong and as deep of technical understanding as if someone was actually in the lab doing research. The difference is I have no bureaucracy. Um, and that's huge. Um, and also, unfortunately, now I have capital too, which is also huge. It frees up a lot of time. Um, and so I, I, I think I very much echo Ashton's sentiments. But I would say, again, it's probably, from what I'm doing, it's programmatic. If, if you're building a therapeutics company, it's probably the delta needed is much harder to just kind of pick up the papers because you got to, you need a lab, et cetera, but still possible. And if you're really, really fanatical about it, there's no doubt in my mind you could do it. Um, yeah. I feel like in the interest of this debate, I'm going to <laughs> argue a much stronger point okay. um, that I myself might not necessarily back, but for the, for the debate, um, I'm going to argue that a PhD is actually a hindrance to being a biotech founder. Because I think when you stay in the lab and you get that kind of experience, you're ingrained in academia, you sometimes get detached from the customers, the world, and the people who are most important in the role of the founder. A CTO, great. You want to have a PhD. A founder, a CEO, you want them to be someone who's gained their experience by going out into the world, talking to people. And by getting a PhD, by staying in the lab, by staying in academia, you actually get further away from that. So I'm going to argue from that perspective, a PhD is a hindrance to being a biotech founder. Well, it depends on who your customer is though, right? Fair. Like as with everything, exceptions define the rule. Like every single rule will have exceptions, but that's what makes it a rule. In the interest of fairness to Ashton, I think I should make it two on two, <laughs> 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 even though I don't have a PhD. Um, but I think it, it very it does depend. You know, we've kind of covered this already, but it does largely depend on the type of product you're hoping right. to make and the type of stage a company you're in. Right. I worked in a lot of like later stage biotech companies where you're commercializing or late stage clinical development, and then to be a leadership role, you need to be able to operationalize people, get a product through regulatory approval, yada yada yada, and that that doesn't require as much heavily scientific training, although it hurts by any stretch. But if you're in an early stage research organization that's trying to develop new therapeutics. I know from my experience, it's very difficult to influence scientific decision making without a really strong scientific grounding. And I've spent two, three years now trying to get to be a world expert in liver disease. And I, and I, and I have gotten there, but it's just it just gives you such a strong base to have a PhD to come into those conversations with. And one other point, which is a shitty point, and it's a it's a point I don't really like to make, but it is the reality to some extent of working in biotech and having spent a lot of time talking to investors. Biotech still suffers from this prestige currency yeah. of academia where investors want to see a strong PhD out of one of the big labs. Not always on all Some investors. <laughs> Some investors, yeah, the more yeah, traditional yeah, biotech true. investors, right? That's, the tech that's investors the are categorically that's, different. That's, so it depends the tech investors the, don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah they totally don't get agree It's very really interesting totally though, because yeah. when you operate the intersection, I've seen both. It's totally agree. You know, Apples and oranges, it's insanely different. So it's- It, it is it is different. And, and we're at a point in our journey where we just closed the series A and we're now thinking about a series B to go into the clinic. And then you start looking for folks to write very large checks in mm -hmm. very binary decision. Like that's where tech investors start to go white in the face. It's where you need to write a hundred million dollar ticket where you're just going to run a clinical study that could fail or, or win. And, there's, and it's all my money. It, it went the later these companies get, I mean, some companies have done a really nice job of transversing like recursion tech to, into, mm. into more traditional biotech investors. But I, I think I, 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 I would like to think we get to a world where you don't need it, but I do think in the, in the very near term, there's still a lot of the prestige economy that affects biotech and investors. Um, do take that into consideration. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm on the side. I'm, I'm going to start <laughs> for, the sake, for the sake of the debate. Well, this is great. Do you mind if I add two points? Michael and Svita? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Always in the takeaways. Okay. Uh, the first point being from a perspective of, of a venture capitalist investor right now, I think there are many ways to evaluate a company. The most important one is not necessarily the technology or the vision of the company. It's really the founders, the team itself. So sophisticated investors do put a massive amount 
of um of uh, of uh not bias but like um of understanding on the actual um team itself and we do look for phds simply because well not necessarily we look for again technically advanced people but requires usually a phd simply because we under we know for a fact that you spent x amount of years within that domain you have an esoteric knowledge within that nobody else in the world perhaps have if you're trying to create like a truly iconic company that no one has ever done before you kind of need that bit of um that deep understanding the second point is if you are creating a biotech company today and it's an early stage company, the, 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 obviously you guys know the founding team is probably the most important part of creating it. And if you want to hire some of the best scientists in the world to work for you, it's very difficult to convince them um, without having that PhD degree. Like, I, like if you want to create, if you want to convince someone to join your team and say, okay, we're working on this, we're working on this, if without you understanding or having empathy for what they've been through of, of, of creating whatever science they wanted to do and understanding the research of it, how are you going to be able to lead them or convince them? How are you able to understand um, the research that they're doing and uh, to be able to kind of pinpoint and, 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 and change the direction of whatever they're actually building out? You have, you have to show them that you understand it so extremely deeply, right? right. So when if the, the hardest hire is the first PhD even on board, Right? Because sure. if they're going to be the chief scientific officer, right, then they can kind of, you know, lead and pioneer all the fellow scientists that they know. So mm -hmm. I think what I did, and it was hard, but to get scientists on board, you have to get basically the first one and you have to understand the research so deeply and so intensely that then they actually take the call with you and then take another call with you until eventually they eventually decide to join the team, ideally. Right. Um, but I do think it's, I think, again, the, the hardest thing about this conversation is that underlying all of this building a therapeutics company Even kind of yeah exactly so, <laughs> so that's the problem right it's like i mean we know i mean another problem with you know the whole like kind of aura around the biotech space is that the history of undergrads leaving and building hardware companies right is like theranos and so people mm -hmm. are like kind of scared right so that's like that's like the history literally because you know how does that happen um so that's another thing that kind of scares i think investors also and then maybe pushes more things you know on the phd side of things of Maybe if you want to do this, maybe you should, you know, get a PhD, blah, 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 blah. Um, anyways, I know we're kind of just conversing back and forth. I'm sure you have probably a lot more questions <laughs> yeah. to get through. <laughs> I, I want to I quickly ask Jack to give his input because I know you, um, you have Quinn on your side. So I'd love to hear about that. Just the, so my co-founder is, is a guy called Quinn. And he has all the degrees and all the PhDs in the world. So I don't need any. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the you mean just in terms of um, how it plays, what, what would I, what, what would I, what's your question? I guess more around Quinn yeah. in terms of. Like in terms of getting, um, getting Quinn on the same page as you and you guys oh, yeah. the company together, like having one yeah. co-founder with the experience and another person. Technical. Yeah. 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 Well, it's kind of interesting. And it, it, again, I, I guess my, I, I think you're right that biotech is a broad aura and you can't cover everything in the same one, but even within the realms of therapeutics, different stages of therapeutics have fundamentally different needs. Like where we have been doing a lot of early stage R&D and preclinical development around finding new biology, validating that in relevant models, and then ultimately developing RNA therapies. But now we're beginning to get to a stage where we're entering the clinic, thinking about later stage pipeline, thinking about where we place our bets in certain markets. And then the lens, then it, then it becomes much more of a, a push and pull around. We can't just let the science drive. We have to have a commercial view of what has the potential, what has the most potential to, you know, to build products that are going to be big products and be successful for a lot of patients, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so I think as the companies mature from early, early R and D, where really deeply technical skills are the currency of finding new drugs. If you're in a really, really or early stage biotech to later stage clinical and ultimately commercial, the, the type of thinking that drives decisions or makes the most impact has to has to evolve with that. So I think, yeah, we've had that, we're kind of going on that journey together as we as we mature the organization. I want to make one helps. more last point on this. Um, one of the principal sayings of the Teal Fellowship is some ideas can't wait. And I bring this up because for ACORN, for what we're doing, when we're doing it, we have to do it now. I had a co-founder before who was taking the technical approach and she actually ended up leaving the company to go and pursue her PhD instead. The thing is the PhD came at the expense of her being the biotech founder because she decided to dedicate that time to that. Like for people who, like a lot of people are going to lose out on the ability to be a biotech founder by going and getting that PhD, especially when you take like women who wanna have children, it's very hard to dedicate that time to going ahead getting your PhD and then trying to go into biotech, you know, right at that critical like 30, 32 age point. If you want to have kids, like you're not about to start your own company. 
So especially for this group of people like myself, like my co-founder who has left, you just can't wait to get that PhD. And that's why I say like the PhD, I think can be a huge hindrance. You guys are very interesting point to kind of end things to end this part of the discussion off on. So for the sake of like, I guess, synthesizing some takeaways for uh, the audience. So I think there's a general consensus that is, you know, it's not fair to compare apples and oranges when it comes to creating software biotech versus platform, bio, like versus like a therapeutic bio, like biotech company, bio pharma company, uh, which is fair. But even, even within the realm of like, uh, you know, wet lab facing, you know, biopharma companies that would traditionally require a PhD, the interesting point Jack made, Jack kind of brought forward is like um, different stages require different needs. And therefore the founders involved will have, will need to have different, um, I guess, different, uh, different skills that are needed. Um, which is different. And, the, uh, and it seems like the universal kind of consensus here is that you may not need a PhD, but you need to have a damn good understanding of what you're doing and building uh, technically. And a PhD is just, is just one of the most well-established ways to do that. I guess trying to piece apart the nuances is to open up the second part of this discussion, the piece about the nuances. So Jack, you're, you know, you, you created this as an industry veteran and Ash, you came in with a PhD and created this company. I'm curious, um, Jack, and when Ash described his experience and, you know, the things that, you know, that he got out of the graduate program um, that helped him be in his position to create a company, do you feel like there was anything that he mentioned that you did not get in your experiences in industry um, field? Um, yeah, I, I love this industry. I've never been called an industry veteran before, so I'm kind of enjoying that. <laughs> but um, I think so my role, I think our roles are probably different in the founding of our two companies, even though they probably they play in similar enough spaces in terms of making new medicines for, for patients. My my role was I was primarily I wasn't in the weeds of the R and D very much on the operational, the finance, the regulatory strategy, all of the messy work beyond product development to actual patient impact. That's kind of my space. Um, and, it's, and it sounds like Ash was, because of his training, because of his expertise, was probably much more in, involved in defining their R&D and research strategy for designing the, the new technology that ultimately will go on and form, you know, the product, the product development strategy from there. So I, I think that that it just, because whatever skills you focus on developing the most, and that was my thinking. I was like, I, I, after doing my undergrad, I was like, I know I don't want to go into PhD because I was, really had a bad experience with the PI and I just had quite a negative environment. I was like, okay, I want to just go figure out how to get medicines from this place to patients and spend a lot of years kind of working regulatory, and all of the manufacturing, all of the kind of messy, boring stuff that has to be done in order to get products to actually improve patient lives. And um, so that was, a, that was the skill set I wanted to learn. And that was where I was coming from, what I brought to Ochre. And whereas Quinn, on the other hand, was just, was very focused on the technology and technology development. So it was a very complimentary kind of arrangement we had, but it sounds like Ashton was probably much more in the science and the actual deep weeds of that than, than I would have been able to be just given my training. I don't know if you so, agree, Ashton, or, or did you have anything there? No, I agree. And I appreciate the perspective of like two different co-founders with completely different skills, but yeah. complementary to create a company is also very important as well, though. So yes, I was very much in the weeds itself, but we also had other people on our team that were much more in the strategy, um, in terms of uh, uh, business, in terms of hiring. Everyone has their skill set. Myself is pure science and, uh, and building out the platform itself. I think, Michael, that's maybe an interesting point to make summarize some of the earlier discussion is like whatever you whatever area you're most interested in doing, it doesn't have to be deeply science, it doesn't have to be commercial, it doesn't have, whatever you kind of feel that you're most interested in, like let that guide your decision around PhD. I, I don't think it should be a binary decision, kind of whatever feels most right. I mean, very cliche advice here, but anyway, I'll shut up now for it. Think it's embarrassing. No, it's, it's a very interesting point. And I think, uh, I think this also brings up a pretty interesting thing to, for, I guess, uh, all the other undergrads in the audience, whether uh, joining us asynchronously in the video or joining us right now, um, which is when you think of being in the weeds of a company and you know being like in the weeds of the founder, the key thing is to differentiate. Okay, so how are you in the weeds? Are you are you the person who's going to be you know focusing on the, log the logistics of translating this product um, mm -hmm. to the bedside of a patient or to the consumer or to a company? Are you in the weeds in that sense, or are you in the weeds literally building like a like developing a product um, in the lab, for example? Or you know, coding coding a software like building the software. I guess um, that's also another really kind of big uh, thing to differentiate when you talk about quote unquote being the weeds. Yeah, and I guess it plays into the different personalities in biotech. Um, running Bio Dojo, just a self plug here, but at Nuclear Dojo, we come across like multiple personalities into 
who are interested in many different things. And Michael and I are a great example. Michael is very much the in the weeds type of guy, but I'm more of the big picture kind of thing. And then we also have Brandon, who's more of like the boring manufacturing part. So <laughs> hypothetically, we're oh, a small set of company. <laughs> <laughs> Not here today, but yeah, it's just, um, it's interesting to kind of see and hear about this unspoken um, thing about, you know, founder-led biotech and how there could be many different kinds of founders beyond just your standard PhD to spin out kind of company. Awesome. I, I would add in something just very briefly here. I think one good strategy if you're an undergrad is to find a co-founder who has a PhD. I've seen that work very successfully, right? So if you are kind of big vision person and then you have someone who has the technical talent, so then no VC from anywhere can tell you nothing, right? Because someone, I've seen that actually very work very well with one of my friends who builds, you know, hard biotech company. Um, their co-founder is a PhD and they're, you know, doing fantastic. So I think if I'm an undergrad right now and I want to build like a therapeutics company, the first step would probably be to find that PhD anchor, right? It probably wouldn't be, let me actually go learn everything and then become, right? Unless it's like a bioinformatics company or something that's a little bit um, not as, you know, involved, I would say find the PhD, then go raise the money and, you know, maybe package yourself up as much as possible as a tech company. So investors are a little bit more warm. I don't know, Ashton, Zach, what do you guys think of like that? Is it feasible, right? I mean... That was my strategy. I, I was never going to be able to build a therapeutics company without it, someone as yeah. technical as, as Quinn. So yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. Some, someone on your co-founding team um, be technical yeah. and having advanced understanding of it. PhD yeah, but I mean, I mean, yeah, which probably means a PhD, but not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Even in my case, I'm, while, I'm, while I'm the dropout, I have on my like core team, I have an MD, two masters, like right. electrical engineer, <laughs> public health. I have like, while I'm a solo founder, everyone else on my team has an advanced degree. And I do mm. have, I have surrounded myself with people like that. Mm. Um, Anna, speaking of your experience as a solo founder, I know you're also um, a woman in biotech and I kind of want to hear more about your experiences and if you come across anything and that you could speak to in particular around that. Regarding what element in specific, like? Like just being a solo founder and then also being a drop, like just unconventional and how you kind of navigated that. And if you've have any, have had any like negative experiences that you can. I have people tell me to go and get my PhD and then come back and talk to them. Um, I found that ignoring them and just continuing to go has actually been very effective. And at some point, like it stops being about the degree that I don't, I do or don't have. And it starts being about, well, look at, well, okay, here's the three patents that are, have my name on it and that my company's been able to produce. And here are the various grants we've won. And here's all the traction we made. And at some point, the results start peaking for themselves. People don't really ask for um, credentials if you have other ways to prove your worth and your company's worth. So I would say at the beginning, there was definitely a lot more, um, a lot more problems. Um, and if, if you're asked about the woman versus like young, I've definitely experienced far more barriers as a result of being a young person rather than being a woman necessarily. Um, I find that most women don't really experience like major discrimination up until the point where they're considering having kids and pregnancy. And that's when that tends to spike up. Um, but I definitely had a lot of people who are like, okay, what are you doing? You're 20, right? Cause that's funny when I started the company, um, and be like, okay, you're 20 years old. Why are you doing this? Uh, correction. I was 19 and, and people, a lot of people didn't take me seriously. Cause they're like, what are you doing? You're a teenager. Who knows? Like, what do you know at this point? Um, and that was definitely where the most rejection was in the time when I had to like just ignore it and keep going. And, and that's all I can speak to that necessary, that necessary experience. Like um, people are going to say like bad things and they're going to be judgmental and they're going to say that you can't do it. And if you listen to them, like, yeah, you won't be able to do it because you're listening to the wrong kind of people. So just surround yourself by people who are not saying those things. And when you hear that, keep moving on. Um, it's worked for me and it's worked for everyone else who's in my position. And Kian, I'm sure you've also had very similar experience of people being like you're too young and whatever yeah I mean I, I would add a couple of things yeah I think like being a solo founder is very hard I mean I, I worked in this company by myself in my bedroom for a year it's, you know it's hard <laughs> and it, it was it was COVID but still it was very dreary time and 
there's a lot of work and a lot of, I don't know, it, it can be very isolating. So I do think in general, having someone else, like it depends very much on your personality and, and who you are. But in general, I think probably having a co-founder is a good idea, especially someone that is exceptional and you trust. Um, I think with the age thing, yeah, I think, you know, not so much anymore, but definitely when I started two years ago, um, there was a lot of, you know, the thing is like with academia is that there's a lot of condescension. There is, right? It's very hierarchical, as you guys said, like it's very much of a status game. Um, and I think it's like you go to, you go in a lab, you know, and the, the, the PI is like, all right, great. You're, you're a freshman, you know, go take out the trash. And you're kind of like, okay, you know, you go in Silicon Valley. They're like, oh, maybe this person is the next, you know, insert arbitrary billionaire dropout. Here's a million dollars. Right. So it's like the, the, the frameworks are so different. One is about almost belittlement and condescension and kind of, you have to do your 10 years. Another one's about empowering and liberating and saying you have great ideas. Right. That, that, that shift is about being in the right environment, which I think is like kind of, uh, Silicon Valley really endorses and embraces. And that can be very helpful. I think when, you know, instead of people telling you like, you can't do it, or what are you doing? You know, people are telling you, yes, you can do it. And here's actually capital to do that. Um, I think naturally, like, you know, we, you know, I started Nucleus two years ago, where it's been one year since we're venture backed, we have a long way to go, we have a lot to build, right? So I really want to be able to speak on these things 10 years from now, post IPO, when we're a $100 billion company, right? Um, that's like, I, I just want to preface that too. It's like, we're still a baby. My company's still a baby. I have a lot to prove. I have, you know, mountains to move. Um, so. And I kind of want to hear, we've been hearing a lot of slander on academia. I wonder if you have any positive experiences to share in case someone genuinely is looking forward to doing graduate school in the future. And it's something that they wish to do. I'm assuming that's targeted towards me, Sarita. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I personally enjoy my, my graduate experience. I think minimally graduate school, it's an opportunity to make these lifelong friends. Also, you can, you can, you can, you can gain that experience in other, other, other places in the world. But for me, graduate school is a great time just to make amazing like-minded friends and colleagues that you'll cherish throughout your whole life together, minimally. And through the graduate education, yeah, it's fantastic. You get a network, you get a, you got to speak to a credible science, you got to learn every day, you have to have growth mindset every day, something new and something challenging. I personally love um, uh, science because, yes, it's a lot of failure towards it, but like every day, it's a new thing you're working on, um, new discoveries. You're the first person in the world, perhaps sometimes, to discover something before anyone in the world sees it, actually. That part of science is just extremely fulfilling and appealing to me. You don't only really get that in other, in other um, disciplines or other areas um, that you work in. So I personally love my graduate school experience. That's not to say it wasn't without its challenges, very much so. Um, uh, graduate school uh, could be a lonely environment sometimes. Also could be a very difficult thing if, you're, if you don't manage expectations very well. As I mentioned before, like experiments all about failure. You always fail experiments 99% of the time before one succeeds. So you have to be able to be okay with that and, and kind of embrace that and learn from that. Um, so a bit of a... Uh, a wide response, but um, yeah, for anyone thinking about doing graduate school, I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. I think you will enjoy it a lot. Um, and if you actually want more information, but in my experience, actually feel free to reach out and I'm happy to um, share my uh, perspective and uh, provide any advice um, uh, um, if you actually choose to, to go that, that, that path. Awesome. Um, yeah, well, just as, as on, on that note, if um, you know, I think everyone's socials are provided here. So if you guys uh, in the event description, so if you guys are ever looking to contact someone, um, I mean, Ashton, Ashton has mentioned his DMs are open. Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, so I want to kind of quickly run back to you know the note on being an undergrad and you know the necessity of having at least someone, at least having one or multiple people with like a higher on your team even if you're like the undergrad dropout founder or whatever. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people can perceive that or like predict that, you know, the most amount of rejection you get is from like VCs and maybe like even recruiting your first technical founder. Were there any other places that you guys, and this is directed to Keon and Anna, were there any other places where you guys felt that there was kind of like a, a gate keeping aspect or, you know, this, this form of um, bear, like resistance to, the, to your background? Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
I will say for the most part, um, when applying for government grants, that's been the most critical point where I need to have someone who's got a PhD on, on the document. Um, typically, it's whenever you're um, going for one of these larger institutions to support you or you're trying to get people who don't know you in a more personal level invested, it is good to just have those like letters behind you. So that's when I've seen it the most play out where I've like most need to have people around me um, who had that since I was lacking those um, initial, you know, three letters after the name. Um, but the other thing I found was as I got further through the journey, so like that was more important at the beginning, things like the Teal Fellowship are now substituting for that. Um, things like all, all the various programs I have managed to successfully go through all the competitions I've won. Those are now like supplementing. Um, they're, uh, they're not like the little three letters after my name, but they're things I attach to now provide um, that sort of authority. So even if you don't necessarily get a PhD, you still have to show that you are credible and you have that claim to authority and that claim that you can do this in other ways. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, um, you know, once you, with startups, everything becomes exponentially easier after you do it the first time with hiring, with fundraising, when you ship the first product down the line, right? So I think it's the biggest problem first for establishing yourself. But once you have, you know, big money coming in, once you have a team, once you have PhDs, it becomes probably not even an issue, honestly. Um, so I think the, the number one thing is just in principle, depending on what you're doing, if you think you need some type of technical cachet to find a, you know, amazing PhD technical co-founder, I think that's probably the like most actionable piece of advice. Cause some of this is like theoretical, right? So the most actual piece of advice, if you're an undergrad, find a PhD, start networking in graduate schools and then see if, you know, there's synergy there. And then, and then I think that will probably you know, knock down all, all your barriers. Um, because the reality is for everyone here, right? For me to Anna, Ashton and Jack and beyond, we all have teams of people working, right? It's like teams of very technical, brilliant people working. Um, so that's really what you need to do, I think. Thanks guys. Um, okay, so I think we've, we've covered quite a bit of ground here, you know, figuring out, all right, so, you know, what kind of technical founder are we referring to when it comes to whether you're not, whether you need or don't need a PhD or if, and if you are an independent founder or, you know, just a non-PhD founder, where will you, where are those resistance points that you'll kind of uh, face or you're likely to face um, because of, of the credentialism uh, on that regard. So thank you for, for going through that. Um, I think even the note of the different types of VCs out there, the differential, the differential between like your, you know, traditional Silicon Valley tech VCs who are going to be pretty anti-credentialist in that regard versus your more, you know, more, I guess your old fashioned VCs who look towards more of the, look for more of the credentials and the, uh, focus more on the three, the three letters and the founders, uh, founders titles. So I think this is really good. Um, I want to leave some time for the questions uh, from the audience because we are getting some questions pouring in. Um, so I want to, I guess to, to kind of package things up, um, what is, uh, we'll start from Ashton and Jack and uh, Anna and Keon. Um, I guess like for, for the undergraduates in the room, let's say, you know, undergraduates in the room, they they want like, you know, for any undergraduate who's considering building a company, you know, either, uh, yeah, considering building a company, um, let's say it's, it's an ambition of theirs. Um, what kind of advice would you, well, you know, what's your one piece of advice that you, you'd give to them? It's a good question. Because my interest is very much aesthetic biology, I would say if you are interested in biology, programming cells and all that, join iGEM. I think it's good to, no, I, I mean, I think it's good to join a team, build something, present it, de-risk it, whatever it may be. That's, you're gonna learn a lot of valuable skills through that experience. And then once you see, maybe you don't like being a founder, maybe you don't like building a company actually, once you gain through that experience, then feel free to actually maybe pursue an actual company yourself. Sorry, I'm up next. Uh, I was just gonna say, um, Surround yourself with really great people. I think iGEM is one great example of how to do that, but both peer mentors, which can be hugely valuable and help you kind of frame problems and think differently about things, but also people who've 
a bit more senior, you can kind of pick their pick their brain and ask questions of. Um, there's just huge value in listening to people who've done it before, been there, and I've gained tremendously from from those types of mentors in my my life. So yeah, I think those just great people, and, and keep coming to events like this and ask questions and putting yourself out there. So yeah, how you kind of meeting up with people ultimately in 3D once we. <laughs> so Jack, I love that. Mentorship is, is key. I love that. Appreciate you saying yeah. that. So this is a piece of advice that I got in my very first startup that crashed and burned my freshman year. I was pitching it at a competition and someone came up to me and said, Anna, would you drop out for it? I said, no, of course not. And then he said, then it's not a good idea. Don't bother with it. Um, and I don't necessarily recommend dropping out for everyone. I actually think mm. that you probably shouldn't unless you're like dead set on it, unless you're like a hundred percent. But that's kind of that core of that piece of advice, right? If you're not a hundred percent, if you're not all in, then it's not worth pursuing. So that I kind of took that energy to my second startup. And that's why, you know, I went ahead, Acorn Gen X. It was something that was deeply personal to me. It was something that I knew I had to be the person to go ahead and bring it into existence. Um, and that's why for me, like, you know, it just couldn't wait. I was willing to put everything for it. So to modify that advice, not like drop out for it, but if you're not willing to, to do everything possible to take this idea to fruition, to take this idea to market, then don't bother. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo some of the stuff that's first said, I think Shani said with great people, everybody knows that. Um, not everyone should be a founder, honestly. Um, most of the stuff you do, I was actually talking to an investor recently and he was saying how a lot of people who are actually very investigative don't like to be founders um, because the actual day-to-day operations running a company is actually really maniacal and really boring uh, in the sense of you're not really doing like hardcore thinking of, you know, some type of interesting genomics concept or something like that. It's, you know, pretty pretty not, not very interesting. I mean, that's just the reality. So I think that's just like to remember, like, um, you know, being a startup founder, I think it's very glamorized, but the reality is the day-to-day can be very just, you know, simple and straightforward and just dreary. So just be just only, it's kind of what Anna said. It's like, you have to be extremely fanatical um, to the point of almost insanity. Um, and you have to make sure you really, 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 really want to do it or else you just get eaten alive, honestly. And it sounds intense, but I think it's probably true. <laughs> right, Ashton, Jack? I mean. <laughs> yeah, agreed. That's fantastic advice, guys. Awesome. Thank you guys for your takes and uh, discussion. I love how it was, uh, it was pretty good natured. And I think we, uh, I think it, it, it gave a pretty good set of pathways for people to kind of investigate later and uh, ask follow-up questions if need be. Um, so we have a tiny bit of time left. So I do want to get at least one or two of these questions in. Uh, so the first question we have was directed at Anna directly. Um, and you know, it was returning to the point of uh, knowing when, like knowing that your idea could not wait, right? It's, uh, on that note. So I guess like from the perspective of how you analyze that problem, the problem that you're, you're tackling, how did you know it couldn't wait? Well, one, I assume that if I didn't go ahead and start working on this right now, someone would go ahead and develop it 10 years out. Um, like within the next 10 years, if you looked at the trends in graphene sequencing and all the developments um, and everything that I knew about that market being there, I was like, I have this information now. And I, you know, if I don't act and I don't do this now, someone else will. And this was an idea that was so personal to me. It was, it was linked to what my family needed, what my, you know, me, my sister, my dad, my, like everyone in my family needed and all the various people I had conversations with who also needed it. that were like personal to me that I, it, it was just like, I knew, like I knew that if, if I didn't go ahead and take that jump and run right now, someone else would do it. And maybe they wouldn't do what I felt was right with the company. And um, that wasn't something I was willing to sit and let happen. So I, I went ahead, I took that jump. I could have spent time exploring other ideas, but with this one, with Acorn Gen X, with how much my identity was linked to it, it was the idea, it was the one. 
Yeah, very interesting. So I guess the, the take home message is if you feel like that idea really is the one and you have a you know, conviction that not enough people are solving this idea, then maybe it is what's really worth it. And I guess, also, yeah. I would, I would just add in, I mean, a lot of like founders start, serial founders can start a lot of companies and they can be extraordinarily passionate about many ideas. So while it is true, like there is like ideas you can be fanatical about, I don't think the fanaticism necessarily linked to one idea. Um, but that said, it should pass the minimal fanatical threshold. But I think like, don't think like if you're interested in a company, like it doesn't need necessarily be like, you know, the end all be all everything, right? A lot of founders I know who are extremely successful, they're passionate about their companies, but it's also not like it's like um, beyond, it's not like beyond fanatical per se, right? Um, so I just think, just, 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 just know that, right? Like, does it, I mean, it's kind of hard than like, what does that mean, Keon? Like, what does that mean? It passes a thing. I think, you know, but I think generally, if you have one thing that passes that threshold, something else can, could also. Um, so don't think it's just like, there's only one idea in the world that maybe is like the end all be all. Um, just something else to think about if, if you're thinking about making the jump. Also, just for the record too, it's much easier to make the jump when someone gives you money. I mean, Right. Like it's very easy. All of a, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you drop out when someone doesn't give you money? Right. Hell no. Someone's not going to do that. Right. Like that's the thing, too. It's like, you know, very post after the fact when you have a lot of money, it's like, oh, yeah, I dropped out. Great time. What it's like, really? It's like, go back. And if you have not a pot to piss in and then deal with my parents telling me, what the uh, are you in? Like, you know, because you know, they're immigrants from Iran. Right. They did not come for this country. You leave your school. Um, so I think, I think it's always, you know, maybe the question is like, oh, should you drop out or not? <laughs> maybe it's probably not the best litmus test, especially in this environment. Well, the market's got a little bit softer. Maybe first, see if you can raise money for it. Take a leave for a year, see how it goes. Build your own Teal Fellowship with, instead of getting money from Peter Teal, get the money from, you know, an angel. Um, because, you know, there are angels around. And I think if someone's sufficiently resourceful, they can find these people. If, if you need help fundraising, please, please ask me. I, I you know, I can help in hopefully any way I can. Um, yeah. I love, I love I love that final way to kind of close the discussion. Thanks, Jan. Um, and thank you, Hannah. So um we are at currently 302. It's a little bit past past the hour. Um yes, I I know I'm, I know you guys are very busy people. Um so thank you again for joining us. Um if you have one more, if you have time for one more question, let me know. But if uh, if you guys would like to wrap this up also, please feel free to do so. We guys go. Do we have a super hard stop right now? Anyone? Otherwise, I I'll hand. I can stay on. I can do one, I can do one more. Yeah. I can stay a little longer if there's any questions. Yeah, I can do another three-ish minutes, but then I do have to just get running. Sounds good. Yeah, I so, got that. Okay, so, um, all right. So this is a, so the final question we have is a bit of a heavy question. So I want to frame it in a way where it won't take 30 minutes to answer um, <laughs> um, for the respect of everyone's time. I guess like, when you were okay, so quickly going around the room, um, if this applies to you, when you were evaluating the problem that you want to solve, what was the biggest variable that you had in mind that made you decide to execute on it versus like pass it up and look for a different problem? Um, wait, so was this directed at anyone or just in general? Anyone can answer, yeah, anyone, anyone can answer if, if, if you feel like the question applies to you and you went to that process. So the idea for Nucleus actually just came from, it spun out of research because I was doing a lot of research. I wasn't necessarily originally going to start a company, but it's one of those things where it's like Alice in Wonderland, where you just start pointing and then you fall in this rabbit hole and you're like, oh my God, right? It was kind of like that. So I think it wasn't like there was ever one discrete moment. I was like, you know, does the economics on this business make sense? It was more like, huh, this is interesting. Oh, this is really interesting. Oh, this is really interesting. And then eventually you look back, you're like, wait a second. There's been an exponential decrease in cost on a logarithmic scale of genetic sequencing. It's almost inevitability of the ubiquity of genomic information. Um, and then what's going to be built on top when everyone has a human genome on their iPhone, right? So it's almost as if you become convinced, not necessarily by taking a step back and just being like analyzing very thoughtfully. Like this isn't like getting an MBA. Like MBAs, if you ever pitch them or interact with them, you think about business in a very kind of regimented, um, like uh, analytical way. I don't think from my experience and from a lot of founders I know experiences, that's how they came up with their idea, right? It was almost a function of them just following their curiosity. 
And then they stumbled into something that stumbled into something that stumbled into something. And then all of a sudden they're like, I think I'm starting a business, but I'm not even sure per se, right? Um, and then everything else that follows. So it's hard to be like this specific thing, push it over the line. But I definitely think as I sit back and analyze the company today, there is an underlying massive market change that convinces me, or at least makes me think, okay, this is worth at least dedicating my life to for the next five years, not only because I love it, because also, even if you're, you know, you, you take a good founder and a, you take a bad founder in a great market, or you, excuse me, take a great founder in a bad market, nothing's going to happen, right? You take a bad founder in a good market, the tide is rising. It, it looks like they can swim. Take a great founder in a great market, magic. Um, so my two cents. I know we have to go real quick. So if you have a comment on that, we can give it to them. I can quickly comment. Just my story was I was originally working on a palliative treatment for Alzheimer's as like a startup. I had by because of work, work I've been doing with my grandmother when she was ill, but it just wasn't really going anywhere. Uh, it wasn't really a great idea. <laughs> and then I met Quinn, and he had a very strong view of what how we could create an innovation in liver disease. And the sort of axis for my decision making was the probability of success versus the pro with the weighted against the actual potential impact if successful. And it was clear to me that even though my idea was like somewhat impactful, it was very low probability of success. Whereas Quinn and the idea he had around liver disease would have been massively impactful for a space that has had very little innovation. And I, and I felt, yeah, there was a high probability that given his background it would actually work. So that was how I kind of said, okay, this is what I want to work on and dived head first into, into liver disease. Anyway, so that's helpful. And, and for myself, I, I'll, I'll go quickly as well though. When we first, when I started grad school, my intention was not to create a company at all. I didn't really understand entrepreneurship at all. It was very much, I want to do a clinical trial. You learn very quickly on that. Once you have science and then you have patients in between that, some, it's, a lot of the times it's a, it's a startup or a biotech or some kind of a pharma company. Um, and then when you develop an invention and you patent it, there's two ways of, of commercializing it, a license or a startup company. And the reason why we spun off into a company was not necessarily because of, of myself, it was because the co-founding team decided that that would be the best approach to kind of get the technology out there and into the um, into, into patients itself. I feel like I spoke to my motivations and my um, starting story sufficiently, so I won't repeat myself. Awesome, awesome. So we have a kind of pretty, pretty interesting, pretty interesting. There wasn't like a super calculated way, kind of uh, big on Keon's original point to taking the problem that started the company. I think it's a very interesting thing. I've I haven't actually read many stories of founders besides maybe Elon Musk. I think who kind of th did that to a degree, but not in. Kind of, yeah, not entirely to that degree as well. Um, yeah, very interesting question. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I know we're a few minutes past the hour, so uh, I will let you all leave. Enjoy the rest of your Sundays. Um, thank you to all our guests for joining us and giving us uh, your perspective. I think this is a absolutely a great uh, conversation, and uh, I think the people on YouTube are going to have a real treat, especially with the Zoom bomb parts cut out. Um, so that'll be that'll be great. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's inspiring. If anyone's interested, <laughs> please reach out to me. I put my email in the chat. My informaticians, we're having a brand new office in Soho. Um, we're, we're growing exponentially. Great way to actually kick start your careers by joining a fast growing startup. I don't think there's actually a better way than that. Um, so please just email me with any questions or anything. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Nucleate, also. Thanks, Nucleate. Sure. And thank you, Nucleate. I appreciate it. Dojo. And thank you, guys. Thanks.